The notion of an image of the world has many philosophical implications. And one of them is clearly Kantian. Conceptions of a world arise in particular contexts. It is the context with regard to which we can account for the constitution a world exhibits. And such an account requires reference to operations of the mind without which the world in question would not be disclosed to us and could not possibly adopt its shape. In this way, Kant explained nature and the world of nature by means of rules that guide the synthetic activities which we have to exert with regard to what is given to us in sensation. But the dependence between a world and the source from which it originates also holds the other way around. Initially, it might seem that the principle in terms of which we are capable of accounting for a world remains independent from what it accounts for. Closer investigation, however, discovers that without the execution of the activities from which a world originates, the principle itself would be incomprehensible. It is precisely this kind of an investigation that is distinctive of the method of Kant's epistemology, which he calls transcendental. It can be shown that the unity of self-consciousness could not even be conceived of unless the very same unity functions as the point of departure of the constitution of a world of objects. And in this way, not only the origin of this world has been elucidated, we also understand why this world is natural and indispensable to us, and for what reason our knowledge claims with regard to it are justified. The very same kind of reasoning can be transferred to the field of ethics. In the first place, the agent and the moral principles that regulate his conduct again appear to be independent from a particular conception of a world. And one could argue to the effect that the very notion of a philosophy which is practical precludes any occupation with cosmological and metaphysical problems. Yet this stance conflicts with the fact that the agent and the intelligent person are one and the same subject. And moral actions in particular, as well as their intentions, cannot be regarded as automatic responses to needs or to an environment. In most cases, it is possible to avoid these actions. And it is always possible to be doubtful with regard to the reasons for which one should act in this way, and thus about the validity of moral claims. But that implies that the moral agent must have thoughts and beliefs with regard to the nature and the sources of his conduct. And if this is the case, we can also attribute to him beliefs with regard to the world within which he acts and tries to actualize his intentions. It is unlikely from the outset that these beliefs would correspond in number to the innumerable beliefs we entertain with regard to the world of objects. But it could be equally rich in structure. And if the beliefs which are inseparable from the point of view of the moral agent are consistent and linked to one another, such that they result in one single network, one can very well call these beliefs a moral image of the world. But then we might be in the possession of two, possibly even more, conceptions of a world which directly conflict with one another. We certainly cannot claim that the world of objects and the world viewed from the moral point of view are totally separate. For the moral action has as its domain the very same situations and circumstances we conceive of as portions of the physical world. Yet physical explanations and the motivation of actions are not reconcilable, at least not with ease. It also does not appear to suffice just to adopt a relativistic approach 
by arguing to the effect that we need and indeed entertain various images of the world with regard to the same worldly affairs. And from that in turn it follows that at least the enlightened moral agent is in need of a view that meets two requirements. Firstly, it relates the various worldviews to one another in some way which prevents their multiplicity from resulting in sheer anarchy or confusion. And secondly, the, world view, so the moral worldview view survives its being exposed to competitors. It remains reasonable and immune to the charge of arbitrariness and irrationality. It rather maintains a certain centrality amidst, amidst other views and a certain superiority over them. Once all this has been accomplished, one is entitled to speak of the moral image of the world in the singular. These introductory remarks on the title of today's lecture might give us an idea of the complexity of the problems the very notion of a moral image of the world poses. They also indicate to what extent Kant's philosophy in its entirety can be regarded as a comprehensive solution of precisely these problems. The three critiques jointly aim at an analysis of the constitution of all rational discourses and at an investigation of the ways in which they originate with the purpose of determining the scope and the limits of their validity and of relating them to one another in a way which provides space for a legitimate role of the moral point of view and also provides the means for the design of an adequate and comprehensive moral philosophy whose key concept is the notion of freedom. This includes, as Kant expressed himself in a well-known passage, that he had to limit knowledge in order to provide room for belief. A belief which consists in nothing but the content of the moral image of the world. Hence one could very well pave the way into Kant's philosophy at large through a discussion of the problems the notion of a moral image of the world gives rise to. But we cannot pursue this course today. For I am expected to focus again the critique of judgment, whose second hundred anniversary this year's Kant lectures celebrate. Therefore, our approach to the problems that are connected with the moral image of the world will be somewhat more historical. And this will eventually enable us to locate the critique of judgment within the development of Kant's thinking about the role of an ethics that contains an account of the moral image of the world within the system of philosophy, a system which at the same time aims at understanding in depth the conflicts which affect and the forces which move the life of a being that is both rational and human. The three critiques as a whole will always appear to the uninformed reader as a monumental monolith with an immensely rich internal structure. One hardly can avoid to believe that Kant outlined his program in advance and in detail before he wrote the first critique and carried it out step by step. Such a belief is not totally misguided for the fundamental theorems of the first critique remain unchanged and serve continuously as premises in all of Kant's subsequent work. On the other hand, it is equally true that in 1781, when the first critique had been published, Kant had no definite plans for writing a separate critique of practical reason. It was rather the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals whose destination was to provide a foundation for ethics. It's a widely held wrong belief that this is an introductory writing. It is a foundational writing. And Kant considered for a while to include what is distinctive of a critique of practical reason in the second edition of the first critique. He wrote the second critique 
because his views with regard to the very foundation of ethics change to a considerable degree. And as far as the critique of judgment is concerned, he arrived at the conception of the book only when he had already written the critique of taste, which in turn he did not conceive of before 1786. These data will already suffice to dissolve the first impression of Kant's work as a monolith. Kant's thinking remained in constant movement and shifted during the period when he published it. And the same holds true with regard to his later work up to the old age when his capacity to keep his thoughts and his sentences under control began to collapse. But then he still wrote about the tantalizing pain of being prevented from the completion of his work. And what he found lacking were not only remote applications of his principles, but rather the presentation of the system itself in a new, definite, and truly comprehensive form. In a sense, <clears throat> Kant's system certainly has a foundation. It consists in the epistemology of the first critique and the conceptual apparatus that is operative within it. But it is not a philosophical fundamentalism in any strong sense. The key notion which leads to the definition of knowledge and provides the justification of our knowledge claims with regard to objects in time and space is much too weak for suiting such a purpose. It only provides minimal means for relating various discourses to one another. The discourses themselves remain relatively independent and the system can only be envisaged when the way in which the discourses fit together and complement one another has been understood. Consequently, the system has to be arrived at through an ascent, not by means of a logical derivation from a set of possibly intuitively convincing premises. It can easily be seen that this conception of the method of systematic philosophy on the one hand and the conviction that one has to assign to moral philosophy a decisive role within the philosophical enterprise, on the other hand, correspond to one another and support one another very well. Thus one can also expect that the correct understanding of the contents of the moral image of the world and its localization within the network and the sequences of discourses will accomplish more than only the solution of a particular problem of an ethics which holds that metaphysical views cannot be totally expelled from ethical questions. The moral image of the world poses a problem which is of a much wider philosophical interest. Its solution must contribute to and become an integral component of the design of the system of philosophy. That Kant is committed to such an assessment of the status of this problem can already be inferred from the composition of the Critique of Judgment. The book unites its various theories, which might appear to be quite remote from one another, under the notion of a purpose, and thus as theories about the employment of the notion of purposefulness in various contexts. But the introduction of the book consists in a treatise on the make-up of a system at large. And the book concludes with an assessment of the kind of ascent which is distinctively connected with the moral image of the world. The two other critiques conform in their respective ways to the same picture. The second part of the critique of practical reason aims at clarification of what a practical usage of reason might amount to. It culminates, too, in an exposition of the moral image of the world. And with regard to the first critique, we have only to remind ourselves that its argumentation comes to a conclusion with a chapter on the ideal of the highest good, which is still another account of the moral image of the world a chapter which is only succeeded by the last chapter of the architectonics of pure reason as such. 
the moral image and the structure of a system are again closely linked to one another. This might once again encourage the opinion that Kant had been all along quite clear with regard to the architectural form of his system. One has, however, to distinguish his conviction that an understanding of the moral image can claim a key role within the system from the stability of his views with regard to the architectonic form of the system as such. Whereas the former remained one of the constants of Kant's thinking from very early on, the latter had still to be gained after the completion of the first critique. And the emergence of a stable view with regard to the composition of the system has been closely connected with a reorganization of Kant's account of the moral image of the world. We should note in passing that this explains why we find in the first critique statements with regard to the foundations of ethics and the contents of the moral image, which are irreconcilable with what Kant expounds in the two latter critiques. This has confused many of Kant's disciples and interpreters, and it has furnished his contemporary critics with apparently powerful arguments. These still very general observations hopefully arouse curiosity concerning Kant's entanglement with the problems which are connected with the moral image of the world and the various ways he tried to come to terms with them. Thus we have now to turn to the roots of Kant's discussions of the moral image. And this will eventually lead us back to the critique of judgment. But then we shall be in the position to assess its doctrines, which concern our question as an ultimate, yet still in some respects transitory state, of a long process of reasoning on the part of a great philosopher. The idea that moral conduct needs to be backed up by a conception of the world when it comes under pressure is as old as our entire philosophical tradition. For it is the basic thought of Plato. Also in Leibniz philosophy, the idea that the moral dimension can only be accommodated, accommodated by a theory of broader scope looms large. Kant was well aware of these traditions he himself was connected with. But he also saw that he would have to reinterpret what he conceived as the truth within them in a totally new way. There is, however, still another philosopher to whom he constantly refers without quoting him when he tries to understand and to justify the moral image of the world. And in this case, he found himself in almost complete accordance with him, such that one can describe Kant's entire philosophy as the result of an attempt to transform this philosopher's thoughts into a scientifically respectable and universally applicable theory. And this philosopher is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Kant always argued to the effect that in philosophizing one has to preserve a sober mind. He criticized what he called enthusiasm in all of its modes. But with respect to Rousseau, he himself could not avoid to become an enthusiast. He was extremely eager to be informed about what happened to Rousseau when he was expelled from Geneva. Rousseau's portrait was the only picture in his study and he knew most of Rousseau's work almost by heart. The letter can be easily explained by what he himself reports, that reading Rousseau inspired him to a degree that disabled him to examine his thoughts and arguments. His remedy was to read Rousseau's texts continuously many times, until eventually he became able to calm down. <laughs> In an anecdote, it is reported that he only once cancelled his after-lunch walk, which his neighbors used for resetting their clocks, namely on the day on which he received his copy of Rousseau's Emile. 
The fourth book of the Emil includes the profession of the faith of the priest from Savoy. This text is the point of departure of Kant's lifelong attempt to understand and to justify the moral image of the world. Thus we have to look briefly into Rousseau's reasoning. The principles upon which the priest's faith is founded is this. He will restrict his investigation to those questions which concern him directly and refrain from further philosophical argumentations. And he will adopt all the propositions that he must approve in the sincerity of his heart as the articles of his faith. From this principle a reasoning arises that in part ponders questions of theoretical philosophy, for instance whether one can possibly understand the existence of the world without tracing it back to an intelligent active cause, that is to say to a supreme will, or whether we can understand our own mind and the knowledge it obtains without conceiving of the mind as the source of activities and without attributing to our will freedom. The reasons Rousseau produces in this way have been also of utmost importance to Kant. For already Rousseau claims that judging is a synthetic activity which presupposes a particular unity on the mind's part. Kant pursued these ideas further within his epistemology. The other part of the priest's profession starts with observations on predicaments the morally oriented life of man has to face. Our conscience requires a certain order of things, which is constantly violated by the course of the world. We everywhere observe that wicked persons succeed and flourish, whereas the just man remains repressed and persecuted. We cannot accept this state as the last instance and as definite. Hence, according to Rousseau, we cannot refrain from approving the tenet that there is another life. I quote, if I would have no other proof of the immateriality of the soul but the triumph of the evil and the repression of the just in this world, then this would be enough for preventing me from having any doubts with regard to it. Close quote. A second and more important article of faith originates with another observation. It is conscience which commits me to a way of contact in the interest of others. Thus it constitutes me as a truly social being. But I cannot justify the demands of my conscience by means of a rational proof. The employment of an unprejudiced reason rather establishes that only a well-calculated way of acting in my own interest is rationally justified. But this amounts to a conflict between two descriptions of the world at large. Rousseau calls them explicitly moral orders, ordre moral. My conscience commits me to the belief in the existence of an order whose center cannot be I myself. It must have a center with regard to which all agents accord. But my rationality as such implies the conception of an entirely different order, an order that has as many centers as there are self-interested rational agents. We don't have any rational proof of the existence of the order of accord. Yet we are utterly unable to accept that the last stance we can possibly take is the belief in the world of the rational calculation for it establishes what Kant later described as a moral paradox. Other quotation from Rousseau, if the deity, that is to say the center of a court, would not exist, only the evil or the wicked reasons rationally. The just man is nothing but mad, insensé. Kant has quoted this inference at many places within his moral philosophy without mentioning Rousseau's name, but he could very well assume that everybody knew to whom he implicitly referred. A number of comments on Rousseau's reasoning and Kant's way of adopting it are in order. First, 
The belief in another life has been based on the disproportional distribution of luck and happiness within the world we know of by experience. The belief in an order that corresponds to the demands of conscience differs from the former belief in this regard. It does not take into account a proportion between moral merit and luck, which appears to be appropriate from the moral point of view. It is rather concerned with the reality of the moral perspective. If we could not even conceive of another order than the one that is the implication of our rational calculations, we would have to conclude that the moral perspective is illusory. The concern is here exclusively with the internal coherence of the moral perspective on life and the world, which in turn is a prerequisite of its adoption on the part of an agent who is a rational being at the same time. The difference between these two points of reference for the foundation of the moral image of the world still remain of great importance within Kant's subsequent reflections. Second, Rousseau identifies the center of the order of a court with the deity, and he understands, without a hesitation, the deity as a divine person. This is to be sure necessary in order to connect the belief in the existence of the order of accord to the belief in the immortality of the moral agent. For the reason for the latter belief was the need for a redistribution of luck with respect to merit. And it appears that only a divine person is able to assess moral merit. But taken by itself, the order of a court could very well be distinguished from a moral realm with the supreme agent as its governor. Yet once they have been identified, the moral image of the world has been transformed into what Kant calls moral theology. Kant, like Rousseau, had no difficulties with making this step, but Kant, in this regard, other than Rousseau, has been able to keep the two moves well apart, to the order and to the supreme will. Third, the way in which the priest from Savoy arrives at the articles of his faith does not address the question in which way the content of the moral image is connected with conscience and the point of view of the moral life. But this connection can be conceived of in at least two ways. Either in this way. Conscience might be self-contained and not at all in need of a conception of the world. Only when it becomes exposed to reflections about its own reality and hence becomes endangered and torn, it needs to obtain help from a reasoning which pursues its interests. The moral image thus conceived is a strategic defense for the sake of the integrity of morality. The defense might be built up spontaneously, not through a detached philosophical speculation, but it would yet be a set of beliefs which results from needs on the part of conscience, and it would engage other sources than conscience alone, namely a usage of reason which is put in an alliance with the moral interest. This is the alternative possibility. One can, however, conceive of the relation between morality and the moral image in a totally different way. The moral image could be a constitutive component of the moral perspective itself. Then one would have to say that conscience and the moral image of the world develop jointly at the same time and as one single and indivisible complex with conscience as its core. It would be pointless to ask for additional resources that provide conscience with an image of the world. The moral agent as such would necessarily be in the possession of a perspective not only on his conduct but also on the constitution of the world he belongs to. Hence it would also be pointless to look for reasons that would enable us to build up a moral image. It would be there and operative all along. Also the moral agent in the role of a person who is questioned by a philosopher 
might be unable to articulate her beliefs in words and might even not know that she in fact holds these beliefs. If this conception of the link between conscience and the moral image would be the right one, only two tasks remain for explicit and possibly professional philosophical reasoning. To analyze and to understand the constitution of the moral image as it emerges together with the moral point of view itself and the attempt to justify morality and the moral image against the suspicion and the charge that it can only be a benign illusion. And this justification would have to address both moral consciousness and the moral image of the world always at the same time. This distinction is as interesting as it is important. It affects directly the way in which philosophy is related to ordinary life and the knowledge that is built into it prior to all theorizing. If the second account would be the correct one, one would have to conclude that the ordinary man is already in the possession of a kind of metaphysics, which philosophy can only understand and defend or destroy but without being able to provide an equivalent. We should also notice that there is a very close connection between the second account of the moral image on the one hand and Kant's epistemology on the other. The transcendental approach to knowledge presupposes that there is an insoluble connection between the self-relatedness of the knower and a particular conception of a world of objects viewed according to the second model, a similar connection holds between the conscience of the moral agent and his moral image of the world. It thus makes sense to say that resource reasoning with regard to the moral image is the predecessor also of Kant's epistemology, which is Rousseauian in spirit anyway. I can, however, not claim that the distinction between the two accounts of the connection between morality and the moral image has been clearly made by Kant himself, let alone at the time when Rousseau began to inspire him. As far as Rousseau himself is concerned, the way in which he arrives at the belief in the immortality of the soul fits better into the first account, where we need reasoning in order to arrive at the image of the world where his argument to the effect that conscience presupposes the existence of the order of a court clearly suggests or even requires the latter account. No conscience without the belief in the existence of such an order. But regarding Kant, we can observe that over the sequence of his sketches of a moral theology, he comes continuously closer to the second account. Eventually, he produced it with clarity for the first time in the critique of practical reason. He himself also never regarded this distinction as a problem of first priority. It was his successor Fichte who assessed it in this way. But Fichte was already exposed to numerous objections against Kant's moral theology, which he tried to smash by showing that Kant's thought can only be understood as an analysis of what is always already conceived of on the part of the moral agent, whereas the philosophers had been lacking the tools and skills of disclosing the ordinary man's and mind's world. The problem with Rousseau that did trouble Kant from the very beginning was rather the following. Within the profession of the faith, Rousseau argued somewhat in the style of Descartes. He tried to secure propositions we cannot possibly negate. He only used conscience rather than consciousness as his fixed point. This procedure resulted in a number of theorems and articles of faith which were only poorly connected to one another. But Kant had been educated within Leibniz school. Thus, a theoretical network, whose consistence and completeness should be ascertained, appeared to him as an irrenounceable requirement for philosophical insight. In addition, Rousseau's talk of moral consciousness had been derived 
from the British theories about the moral sense. Kant himself did sympathize with Francis Hutcheson, who had shown the irreducibility of the moral perspective. But he also believed that morality cannot possibly be understood as originating from a particular sense. One rather has to aim at understanding in which way it results from a distinctive and irreducible usage of reason. And it was Rousseau himself who encouraged him to this view. But this time Rousseau as the author of the Contrat Social. The general will is obviously a rational principle. And if it is valid within the philosophy of law, it should have at least an analogue in the philosophy of moral conduct. And after all, Rousseau did emphasize the active nature of the human mind, even within the Emile, to an extent that makes his reference to the immediacy of conscience an archaic stranger within his discourse. Consequently, Kant began to investigate possibilities of understanding the origination of the moral point of view such that the emergence of the moral image of the world becomes comprehensible at the same time and on the very same grounds. The accomplishments and the failures on this way led him eventually, rather late and through many shifts, to the doctrine, the critique of practical reason, and the critique of judgment share. Before turning to two stages on Kant's troublesome way, we should briefly pay attention to a dimension of Kant's thinking, which exerts continuously an influence upon his reasoning within his moral theology, his analysis of the traditional notion of God. Kant's first critique leads, among so many other things, to the insight that the traditional ontology had been entirely misguided in its estimation of the order and of the usage of various fundamental notions. Where one used to conceive of these notions as a continuum that specifies the notion of being, Kant discerned a variety of origins and usages. Thus, for instance, the concept of causality, the concept of identity, and the notion of the infinite differ completely in status and in origin. Before Kant arrived at these results, he had already applied the same method upon the notion of God. This notion can only be understood as the result of a complicated or rational synthesis of a number of notions with different origins. It contains the notion of a necessary being. Yet taken by itself, this notion would never issue the singularity of God. It contains also the notion of a supreme, a most perfect being. But this idea does not imply the necessity of God's existence. And most importantly, although our notion of God contains God's personhood, there is no way of convincing us on rational grounds that the necessary or the infinitely perfect being must be in the possession of a reason and a will. For all our knowledge with regard to reason and will depends upon our familiarity with our own will and reason. And they are clearly marked by our finitude in a way which precludes the idea of their being increased to the degree of infinity. They are, to be sure, distinctive real properties, and God is all perfect. But to the infinite being we can only attribute infinite properties. Consequently, we would have to conceive of reason and will as secondary, derivative perfections, an always viable way of accommodating them. And given that this is possible, we have no decisive reason for attributing to the infinite being a mind and a will of a totally different and thus totally incomprehensible kind. Kant didn't allow this tenet to surface in his texts to maximum visibility for obvious reasons. But he proclaims with all desirable clarity that only by means of the reasoning of moral theology one can arrive at the notion of the personal God. Speculative theology 
doesn't rule it out, but it is unable to lead to it. It doesn't even indicate it as Kant remarks in the Critique of Pure Reason. And in pursuing this line of reasoning, he remarks also that the notion of God, the philosophical tradition analyzed as the summit of the achievements of speculative reason, originated from the very pure conception of the moral life in our religion. This puts Kant's concern with the moral image of the world in still another perspective. By understanding this image, he could hope to understand in greater depth the way in which the various usages of reason cooperate. They eventually arrive at conceptions by means of which what appeared to be and indeed is divergent at the beginning reveals its belonging to an architectural design, a design within which the rationality and the conditions of the reality of the moral life function as the keystone. I already pointed out that the encounter with Rousseau induced Kant to adopt definitely other positions besides moral theology as the best approach to philosophical theology at large. Two of them have been of importance for his subsequent reconstruction of moral theology itself. Firstly, he adopted the conviction that rational discourses have to be analyzed as resulting from the employment of activities. He soon distinguished between the activity of the intellect and the activity of reason. The former organizes our knowledge of objects that are given in intuition. In contrast, the latter projects ideas of a maximum or an utmost limit, either a limit of a sequence of causes, grounds, and underlying entities, or a maximum of order. Secondly, he used his new analysis of what an idea, a maximum, consists in by applying it to the order of conduct. And this resulted in the discovery of the categorical imperative procedure. If everyone's actions and intentions would be such that the principles which guide them could be adopted by everyone else, and if everyone's will could always approve such an order without running into a contradiction, a maximum order within each individual's will, as well as within all wills, would be established. In this way, Kant had arrived quite early at one of the fundamental theorems of his ethics. But Kant learned too much from the moral sense school in order to believe that with this move alone, his ethics would have come to its completion. A moral philosophy always has to produce, in addition to the principle that tells effectively apart the morally good and bad, an account of the motivation of disinterested actions. But the more rational the principle of discerning the good becomes, the more difficult it will be to understand the motivation of the will which complies with the rational demand to act in the disinterested moral way. Kant rated this problem as so difficult and at the same time so important that he referred to it as the philosopher's stone. By now we are in the position to turn to Kant's first explanation of the moral image of the world. He never published this theory, although it is highly original. It had been attractive to Kant for many years because if it could be defended against all objections, it would solve three problems at once. First, it would explain the origination of the moral principle itself, that is to say, the categorical imperative. Second, it would provide an explanation of the moral motivation. And third, it would show in what way the moral image of the world is connected with the moral principle. I shall give a brief survey of this still almost unknown theory in 12 very short steps. I don't enumerate them, but they are 12. We have many needs and desires we cannot possibly relinquish. 
they are not only different, but also conflicting with one another. We pursue them in various ways and degrees, possibly prudently, but that means still with continuously changing preferences and postponements. This situation is unsatisfactory to a rational agent. And since he has the idea of a maximum at his disposition, it leads to the application of this idea to the needs and desires. Thus the idea of a maximum satisfaction arises, the idea of happiness. We cannot avoid striving for happiness. Yet at the same time we cannot even conceive of a realization of this idea. For there is no conceivable state within which, for instance, maximal peace and maximal excitement could coexist. But then the inescapable adoption of the idea of happiness leads to a much greater disorder than we experienced in the first place. For from now on we cannot avoid connecting with the pursuit of a particular desire the hope that this will lead us to our happiness. And since we also know that the hope will be thwarted, we shift to the other, always futile, projection of what our happiness might consist in. All by it, possibly in a daily routine. But the daily routine would uh, only cover the internal uh, conflict between the desires and their being heightened uh, to the hope they might satisfy us in a maximum way. Our reason must become deeply discontent with such a situation. For the application of the idea of a maximum order resulted in an increase of disorder within our conduct. The idea of happiness originated from reason, but it caused a state which is opposite to what reason always intends to accomplish. In such a situation it becomes mandatory that the idea of order will be applied once more. But this time it projects the idea of a kind of conduct that is necessarily released from all disorder, a maximum accordance among all imaginable actions, but without taking into account particular interests and desires. And thus the idea of the moral law originates. The moral law imposes a condition upon all our striving for happiness. It can, however, not amount to abandoning the hope for happiness for both ideas arise from reason as such. Consequently, the demand of the moral law is only to the effect that we suspend our hope for happiness whenever we meet situations to which the moral law applies. Furthermore, we have to conceive of happiness such that it cannot be attained unless the moral law has been fulfilled. But given the internal connection between the moral law and the idea of happiness, it follows that the moral law confirms the legitimacy of the hope for happiness. Hence it also implies the promise that our hope will be fulfilled to the degree in which we meet its demand. And this enables us to accept our situation, which is such that we cannot even imagine in what our happiness could possibly consist. Our hope will now be directed toward another order beyond our knowledge toward another dimension of our lives. With regard to it we know only that it must be a realm where a deity guarantees the appropriate distribution of happiness and moral merit. And thus we have arrived at the moral image. But at the very same time we have arrived at an understanding of the motivation of the goodwill. The fulfillment of the moral law is the only way in which our unrenounceable hope for happiness could be realized, albeit in a way we cannot conceive of. And this is the strongest motive we can imagine. And yet, it is not a motive of calculated self-interest, for we know nothing about the way in which we might eventually reach our happiness. We have to meet the demands of the moral law and to trust its promise in the first place. To the many of you 
who know about Kant's published moral philosophy, it might be a surprise that this is the theory of Kant's. But you will realize that it is powerful and that it provides solutions to many urgent problems through one single chain of conclusions. It doesn't happen frequently that a philosopher who possesses a theory of this kind and power abandons it silently. Kant began to withdraw from his first moral theology well before the publication of the Critique of Pure Reason. But he replaced it with what we can describe as an intermediate theory which preserves many features of its predecessor and whose traces can be found at a number of places in the concluding chapters of the Critique of Pure Reason. Yet the definite rejection of the first moral theology must have taken place during the preparation of Kant's first book on moral philosophy, The Foundations of the Metaphysics of Morals, 1785. Here we cannot explore the reasons for which Kant abandoned the theory, which we can call the theory of the worthiness of happiness. It should be a good exercise for a student of Kantian ethics to dismantle its construction plan and to point out the reasons of its failure. But Kant's mature theory clearly indicates what must have become a major source of Kant's satisfaction with this beautifully designed theory. The theory suffers from a number of ambiguities, primarily within its account of moral motivation. Thus, it imposes a condition upon every hope for happiness, which also requires that we abstract from all sensual interests. But on the other hand, it derives all motivating power on the part of the moral law from the hope for happiness. It also intends to derive the rationality of the belief in God and the moral order from the validity of the moral law. Yet reversely, it makes this validity depending in part on the very same belief. These are two of the ambiguities. Once Kant had become able to see through these ambiguities, he was ready for a radical change in the basic design of his ethics. A moral philosophy that deserves the name has to adopt as its point of departure the tenet that actions can only have a moral value if their motivation derives from nothing but the moral law alone. And this is operative within the composition of the foundations of morals. The very first sentence which dominates the entire book uh, derives from a self-correction on Kant's part. So one has to be sensitive to this accent uh, behind it in order to understand what sort is going on. It was this insight that led to Kant's well-known theory of the respect for the law as the only moral motivation, a theory which cannot be explained as the result of a pietistic education, but rather only as the conclusion of a long process of reasoning. Yet its adoption resulted in a reconstruction of Kant's ethics in its entirety, and indeed in much more, namely in a new conception of the moral image of the world and in a new shape of the philosophical system at large. For the respect for the law is a primordial motivation. It is impossible to derive it from other impulses or desires. It also cannot be derived from reason in general. It rather directly derives from the awareness of the validity of the law. This implies that the principle of practical reason cannot be reduced to reason as the source of the idea of a maximum. The general structure of reason, and thus this, this idea, underlies, yet does not issue the moral law. In precisely this sense, the law is a fact of reason. The insights that the validity of the law is a fact and, the only, and that the only moral motive is respect for the law fit in well with the contention backed up by the first critique that morality is the only manifestation and actualization of the freedom of the will. 
for we are lacking any means for providing a proof of this particular kind of freedom. Hence, it can only manifest itself by itself. And consequently, the need for a defense of the belief in freedom cannot be met in any direct way. It can only be shown that this belief connects perfectly well with all proofs reason can provide and with all other convictions it supports in one or another way. Taken together with the result that we cannot even expect a proof of freedom might be possible, this way of arguing provides us with the only imaginable and thus also satisfactory defense. All this alters the view of the overall structure of reason as well as of the way in which philosophy advances its insights and connects its disciplines in a dramatic manner. It cannot derive theorems from highest and self-evident premises. It rather has to climb upwards in its investigation of the connections between relatively independent domains of discourse. And since all these connections eventually indicate the reality of the principle, namely freedom, from which the moral conduct emerges, a comprehensive moral philosophy constitutes the conclusion of, rather than one of the applications within the system of philosophy. Before he had arrived at this conception, Kant could not possibly have conceived of a critique of judgment. The book as a whole is shaped as a partial discipline within philosophy as an ascent. The very notion of a reflective judgment, the key notion of the book, is the notion of an ascending power of the mind. And its other key term, the notion of purposefulness, is applied in an ascending manner too. The critique of judgment begins with particular kinds of purposefulness, like the beautiful and the organism. It proceeds to nature as a teleological system and arrives at the moral image of the world. In addition, the book is conceived as a network of theories which connect our basic knowledge about the laws that constitute the empirical world with the ultimate ideas of reason and provides an orderly transition from the former to the latter. Before the revolution of Kant's thought that led to the second critique, the third critique would not have been a possible candidate for a component of the philosophical system. We now have to return to the moral image of the world. Kant's account of it obviously had to be modified once he had abandoned the theory of the worthiness of happiness. But this change could not only consist in revisions with regard to the explanation of the moral image. Kant's conception of the way in which the moral image is joined to the moral point of view had to be revised too. For his new moral philosophy must be traced back directly to the exclusion of any role happiness might play within the motivation of the agent. Respect is the only motivation of the goodwill. So, for what reason is the agent in need of a moral image of the world at all? Kant could not possibly answer this question negatively. He was too deeply convinced of the correctness of Rousseau's vision. Thus, he promptly produced a new joint between the goodwill and the moral image. The moral law demands a particular kind of conduct, but to act always means to pursue purposes. Hence, the moral agent pursues purposes that derive from the goodwill. He attends at helping other human beings, and he aims at improving the overall condition of the society such that the evil not longer flourishes, whereas the just man suffers. And since he simply cannot follow the laws demand without believing that it is possible to succeed in all these regards, he accepts, together with the validity of the law, a view of what the world is like. Its constitution must be such that its effects are not indifferent to or even counteractive to morally motivated actions. And this belief is a necessary implication of the agent's moral conduct, whether he becomes aware of it or not. It amounts, however, to assuming the existence of a moral order, 
which is such that a final purpose of the moral effort can be arrived at. Moral actions of which we would believe that they would always cause harm or worsen the condition of the society would be self-stultifying. Hence, we can attribute to the goodwill a moral image of the world regardless of what the moral agent might be capable or willing to assert. Kant points out clearly that the belief in the existence of such an order has still to be distinguished from a belief in God's existence. Yet he claims that we cannot imagine a way of accounting for the existence of this order which does not have recourse to a supreme rational will. Thus he arrives again at the very same moral image. Yet at this time it is not founded upon the agent's own hope for happiness, but only on the belief on the agent's part that it is possible to promote a state of the world where merit and happiness are distributed in some way that is not in open conflict with moral principles. This account of the moral image became Kant's official doctrine. It is stated in the Critique of Practical Reason for the first time it also prevails in the critique of judgment. It is indeed immune to charges that a moral image thus conceived still depends on covered interests on the part of the agent, which are not exclusively moral. Kant can also avoid the objection that the moral image is nothing but a helpful fiction the agent needs in order to persuade himself of the reality of the moral law. For the image arises spontaneously together with the good will and cannot be separated from it. The theory is thus clearly superior to Kant's prior attempts to solve the problem posed by Rousseau. The new account suffers, however, from other weaknesses. And a few symptoms within the critique of judgment indicate that Kant soon became aware of a major weakness in the way in which he produced his theory. When Kant had arrived at his mature ethics of the respect for the moral law, which is a fact of reason, he swiftly redesigned the moral theology. It took him days probably only, because it followed so nicely from uh, the new perspective. And he could indeed be pleased with the results. He employed as the key instrument for the redesigning the notion of a final purpose of our actions. For only such a final purpose would enable him to re-establish a moral image with the very same content as the preceding theory of the worthiness of happiness, with the exception of the involvement of the agent's own personal interest, which was now excluded. But Kant took little pains with providing an analysis of the reasons which would justify his claiming that every moral action has to take place with regard to a final purpose of the world, which it has to adopt as its ultimate perspective and objective. Yet such an analysis would have been mandatory because of the distinctive pattern of Kant's ethics itself. The moral law demands that all our actions have to be of a particular form, the law as such remains totally indifferent to both the objectives and the outcomes of the actions of the will that adopts maxims which meet the requirement of universal liability. These maxims, to be sure, constitute also particular objectives. And Kant argues correctly that all moral conduct would collapse if we would have to believe that all moral actions would have effects which prevent that their objectives will be actualized. Yet holding this and claiming that all moral actions jointly aim at the highest good in the world are clearly two different affairs. Kant became aware of this gap in his argumentation fairly soon. And the reason why he could not avoid taking notice of it was none other but the central complex of problems of the critique of judgment itself. The divergent subjects of the book cohere in the investigation of the various uses of the notion of a purpose. And although Kant argued to the effect that these usages point to the usage of the notion of a final purpose, he could hardly overlook 
that an account of the source from which this very notion is generated would be needed. It can, to be sure, emerge only within the moral context, but in precisely what way? Kant doesn't address this question in the Critique of Judgment. He begins, however, to experiment with alternative strategies which might connect a moral image and the notion of God with the principle of his ethics. This does not mean that he became suspicious with regard to the notion of the final purpose as such. He, in fact, never dispensed with it. But within the publications that succeeded the third critique, he disclosed in passing his new insight, which he expressed in the basic language of transcendental philosophy. A connection between the notions of duty on the one hand and the final purpose on the other hand is a synthetic one. And since it takes place independently from experience, it is synthetic a priori. Hence, the philosopher has to meet the task of explaining the conditions of its possibility. Kant also provides a certain key for the solution of the problem, yet with the remarkably reluctant qualification that it is a key only, I quote, to the extent to which I believe to have an understanding of the matter. This marks the beginning of Kant's attempts with regard to the moral image during the last decade of his work. And these efforts came to a standstill only within the last philosophical passages Kant was able to write. These lines, almost like the last brush stroke of a Zen master in the minute of his death, are related to the primary concern of his philosophy at large, the way in which a philosophical system can be built and completed, and the way in which it is related to the moral image of the world. But this I have to leave to another occasion. In concluding, I want to say this. Rousseau's and Kant's concern with the moral image of the world have exerted an enormous influence. It is one of the most important roots from which the entire spectrum of post-Kantian philosophy has grown. It inspired Fichte as well as Hegel, Kierkegaard's notion of existence as well as Marx's notion of an ideology can be traced back to it. But even that would not suffice for justifying that one spent so much time with it. I think, however, that we too still have many reasons for investigating further what Kant pursued in a lifelong effort. Whoever finds modern physicalistic materialism strong to the degree of irresistibility has to accept that all his personal life, its conceptions of knowledge included, proceeds within a network of indispensable illusions. Who thinks differently must know that an easy reconciliation between objective knowledge and the perspectives of the first person's viewpoint is not available. Only a subtle philosophy can possibly accommodate the latter in depth without eliminating it at the same time, possibly involuntarily and only by implication. That's also that this is so can be explained to a considerable degree by the mutual dependencies between self-interpretations of the first persons on the one hand and images of the world on the other hand. Consequently, we cannot refrain from investigating these numerous connections, from relating them to one another, and from examining to which degree we are justified to accept these perspectives as both irreducible and valid. I personally believe that Kant was indeed ill-advised when he identified without hesitation the moral order with the order of the highest good and the realm of grace. But that by no means implies that the notion of a moral order can be dispensed with or that it is devoid of content. In addition, we have differently from Kant to distinguish between various kinds of moral conduct and between stages within the development of the moral awareness of man. And this adds to the employment of the notion of the moral image of the world's still another dimension. Hence, although our analyses have shown 
that Kant's books cannot possibly be used as sources of everlasting insights and theories, he did found a philosophical tradition and opened up a philosophical perspective we can and should remain affiliated with for very good reasons. Thank you. Very fine presentation. The uh, uh, floor is open for uh, questions. So, Professor Henry, to recognize people as they raise their hand. ...that you alluded to at the end of your lecture. That is to say, not, I take it, what we call typically Kantianism in the sense of the basic framework of the critique of pure reason, but rather what you seem to define more broadly as an attempt to reconcile, and here I became <coughs> unclear, reconcile the moral order with, with what? That is to say, with materialism or with a kind of view of nature which may or may not be materialistic, but somehow obeys different laws from the moral. I mean, it wasn't clear to me what the contrast was in that uh, outlook that you said we should associate ourselves with. I didn't want to say that uh, all that has to be reconciliated is materialism, the physicalist materialism on the one hand, and the moral image of the world on, on the other hand. Of course, I mean, I, I have to say that I'm attracted by materialism, uh, and, but I see what the consequences of adopting it are uh, in the philosophy of mind uh, and also in uh, moral philosophy. Mm. What I pointed out is that one has to be aware of uh, the magnitude of the problem. Uh, of course, many people are aware of uh, the importance of the problem, but the connection with what I presented in the lecture is that um, it's, sort of, it's the following. We cannot hope for a reconciliation such that we assign to um, our Scientifically, scientifically respective uh, description of the world of the, that that we that, that we associated with a materialistic approach, and then preserve some whatever it might be um, pragmatist uh, or um, sociological. Uh, justification of that moral dimension. That's impossible because the moral dimension includes too much. It includes uh, a moral image of the world too. And this is just the setting up of the problem. Yeah? We might eliminate morality uh, as we might eliminate intentionality. Yeah? Say, well, this is a useful talk. We can't dispense with it in this sense. But theoretically, we shouldn't be committed to it. Um, I think this, although it doesn't want to uh, amount to this, amounts to an elimination. Because the claims are refuted and the claims are connected to it. Uh, what shapes the moral perspective? So we would need other, I mean, so we, we could swell out this then. And many people swallow that. Now, if Plato, Rousseau, and Kant would march in, they would say they uh, accept the materialistic perspective only in classroom. Uh, a serious questioning would begin. Um, and they would try to point out that, exposed to the paradoxes, the, the practical dilemmas Kant speaks. And, uh, under the pressure of the insisting on the part of the philosopher that we shouldn't 
disconnect our views as philosophers from the views we actually hold as living persons. Um, we, the three of them might arrive again at the very same result Socrates arrived at. And that then would open up the philosophical debate again. Of course, there are other possibilities. You uh, could have a philosophy of nature with emergent properties, etc., etc. You could design such a philosophy in the, in, in the way which broad ones did it and write a book on morality's place in nature etc etc you could adopt uh, a generally pragmatistic approach science itself it's just another point of view and we don't know about the world uh, as it is in itself anything etc 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 i didn't want to uh, suggest that a particular solution of the problem uh, is the only one that is defensible i just wanted to show in concluding that we are still with this problem. I also said at a point that I don't believe that uh, an easy relativism would lead us very far. Uh, Kant, in a way, also uh, distinguishes various approaches to the world, but they are systematically connected to one another, um, such that we understand why we can't avoid entertaining them, and why, uh, once we understand uh, the connection, we can adopt all the views at the same time without running into uh, inconsistency. This, in a way, is Kant's enterprise. And uh, as he said, I mean, in a way, I said the same what he said with regard to the problem of freedom. Um, so many uh, philosophers of his time had easy solutions for it. And uh, his remark in the Critique of Practical Reason um, would justify that such an enormous investment had to be made in order to come to terms with the problem. And he remarked that uh, a problem about which two millennia have thought without a definite result cannot be solved at the surface. So that's uh, what I claim here. I, mean, I didn't provide a spectrum of possibility, but no solution at the surface. Yes, um, you described uh, the methodology of Rousseau's uh, Savoyard ticker as uh, inquiring about uh, claims that we cannot refrain from believing. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, uh, well, two things. Kant's attitude towards the force of that cannot. And also, perhaps something about a little bit about the later reception of that sort of methodology. I'm thinking of the opening of this Grundlage, where he describes his methodology as saying that he's inquiring about what we find we must think. And you see a but it's important to locate uh, this must. It is not the must of the philosophical theory, which tries to arrive at results on rigorous, uh, based on rigorous argumentation. It is the must on the part of the mind, which is the subject the philosophical theory has to scrutinize. And the must uh, is established by philosophy, it's rather understood by it. And I think this is a, this is a Rousseauian turn in late 18th century philosophy. Uh, we can't expect too much from philosophical theory. It will not, by using its own resources, open up a perspective to the world we then can adopt. We have to find uh, the perspectives which are already operative in the mind. And the ordinary life is such that these perspectives are covered. The public discourses are fit to articulate them. So there is much more thought in men than there is in the classroom. It's informal. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a structure. 
and the systematic part, uh, it can't defend itself um, in front of uh, the professional philosopher. But there is no objection to it, because it's rather the uh, fall on the philosopher's part, not to address what's already there. And you can easily see that what put from this emerge. All existential philosophy comes from that. Although existential philosophy doesn't know it, that it comes from that. <laughs> All of Hegel comes from that. The phenomenology of the spirit is uh, an enormous extension of analyses, of points, of, of, of images of the world as they are connected to conceptions of the knowers. And Fichte, of course, is uh, the Jacobine version of the Rousseauian. He found it Kant. Everything is already in the ordinary man. And what is the point of the French Revolution? It is to do away with artificial theory. Uh, they are like feudal organizations of the life and this elaborate court system, which has nothing to do with Rousseau's teacher, the ordinary man. Uh, philosophy has to, and this is Socrates in modern habit and uh, caustic, caustic. Uh, we have to understand in the first place the thinking which is going on all the time. And as a matter of fact, all philosophy arises from, and if it doesn't realize this and trace back its own origin to the ordinary thinking, it will always remain confused and in need of some uh, inherited artificial system. It will try to relate itself uh, and to imitate sciences, which are of course perfectly all right because they serve particular purposes. But philosophy has another uh, method and destination. You see the Rousseauian spirit. Kant actually, uh, he has this magnificent confession, in, 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 which I think is much better known than um, the first account of the more image of the world, where he, uh, in, his, in his manuscript, he remarks like in a diary, you know, I have been a scholar by, I myself have been a scholar by information. I felt uh, the first to gain knowledge and the deep satisfaction with every accomplishment. And then he can find Rousseau has corrected me. I learned to honor man and I would regard myself as less worth than the ordinary worker. If I wouldn't believe that all this, which means what he does, would contribute to one thing, to secure the rights of mankind. So this is, um, I don't know whether I got it correctly, but this is, uh, this is Kant. And what one has to see is that this is not uh, um, a confession which addresses the aims of philosophy. What justifies that philosophy is done, has it will be done, it, it, it addresses the internal structure of philosophy. The way in which it develops as a kind of knowledge. And I think that uh, I tried to, I didn't refer to concept epistemology, but it's the same, the same holds true with regard to it. The knowledge we talk about in, uh, when we talk about the categories is not a knowledge on the part of the, of the, of the scientist, it's knowledge on the part of the ordinary man. Uh, and philosophy has to uncover it, to disclose it, rather than to build it up. All right, I'm, I'm uh, Rachel has a question before we... Um, so. this, you probably addressed this, but in the course of your development of Kant's, your explanation of Kant's movement from his earlier uh, moral theory to his mature moral theory, I forgot what this is what the is supposed to be. Um, why does the moral image of the world, according to Kant, include happiness for the good people and suffering for the wicked? Maybe just, maybe just explain that in light of his mature view, I believe, from 
well, I'm good. That is a comparatively easy reasoning, which uh, is still in need of uh, justification. I, I try to explain what I said in such a way that I don't think uh, that I'm not committed to the view that happiness tends to be distributed in uh, complete uh, proportion. So, uh, morality, such that, that I think is a suspicious move, we can discuss it. Um, I have to get exactly as much happiness as I deserve. And this is, of course, in the Christian religion and in many other religions, but we probably would be reluctant to uh, take that without further consideration. But the resource uh, uh, practical dilemma is designed in a different way. It is just not acceptable that the just men suffers and uh, the wicked, the mafia boss, etc., dies in perfect happiness. Uh, why is it so? That's what, what we are. Now, from the point of view of reason, from the point of view of reason, we have to conceive of happiness as good which uh, is distributed among men and moral merit too. Uh, if we would conceive of ourselves as uh, the creator of the world, as somebody who would establish an order in the world, we would never uh, leave the true universal, uh, let's say, good, distributed in a completely random way. Um, I don't know whether I can do much more uh, than uh, uh, pointing this out. Is that Kant? I mean, if you yes. press Kant on that, not just yourself, that would be a huge response. Like, yes. I mean, we can, we, can, we can give an argument which is a little bit more uh, uh, theoretical in nature. There is a demand on the part of the moral law. We should act in a particular way, and this is the supreme uh, demand. Uh, we have to respect in the first place. Given that it is uh, the primary perspective to everything, and given that we conceive of a moral law such that um, it is related to what happens in the world at large in general, we also have to conceive of happiness as being put under the condition of the fulfillment of the demand. 